The Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1, Section 1, Continued. Cassette 5, Side 2. But most often it was merely a matter of cynicism. The blue caps understood the workings of the meat grinder and loved it. In the Jida camps in 1944, interrogator Mironenko said to the condemned Babich with pride in his faultless logic, Interrogation and trial are merely judicial corroboration. They cannot alter your fate, which was previously decided. If it is necessary to shoot you, then you will be shot even if you are altogether innocent. If it is necessary to acquit you, then no matter how guilty you are, you will be cleared and acquitted. This evidently refers to their own people. Kushnaryev, chief of the first investigation department of the West Kazakhstan Provincial State Security Administration, laid it on the line in just that way to Adolf Sivilko. After all, we're not going to let you out if you're a Leningrader. In other words, a Communist Party member with seniority. Just give us a person and we'll create the case. That was what many of them said jokingly, and it was their slogan. What we think of as torture, they think of as good work. The wife of the interrogator Nikolai Grabishchenko, the Volga Canal project, said touchingly to her neighbors, Kolya is a very good worker. One of them didn't confess for a long time, and they gave him to Kolya. Kolya talked with him for one night, and he confessed. What prompted them all to slip into harness and pursue so zealously, not truth, but totals of the processed and condemned? Because it was most comfortable for them not to be different from the others, and because these totals meant an easy life, supplementary pay, awards and decorations, promotions in rank, and the expansion and prosperity of the organs themselves. If they ran up high totals, they could loaf when they felt like it, or do poor work, or go out and enjoy themselves at night. And that is just what they did. Low totals led to their being kicked out, to the loss of their feedback. For Stalin could never be convinced that in any district or city or military unit he might suddenly cease to have enemies. That was why they felt no mercy, but instead an explosion of resentment and rage towards those maliciously stubborn prisoners who opposed being fitted into the totals, who would not capitulate to sleeplessness or the punishment cell or hunger. By refusing to confess, they menaced the interrogator's personal standing. It was as though they wanted to bring him down. In such circumstances, all measures were justified. If it's to be war, then war it will be. We'll ram the tube down your throat, swallow that salt water. Excluded by the nature of their work and by deliberate choice from the higher sphere of human existence, the servitors of the Blue Institution lived in their lower sphere with all the greater intensity and avidity and there they were possessed and directed by the two strongest instincts of the lower sphere, other than hunger and sex, greed for power and greed for gain, particularly for power. In recent decades it has turned out to be more important than money. Power is a poison well known for thousands of years, if only no one were ever to acquire material power over others. But to the human being who has faith in some force that holds dominion over all of us, and who is therefore conscious of his own limitations, power is not necessarily fatal. For those, however, who are unaware of any higher sphere, it is a deadly poison. For them, there is no antidote. Remember what Tolstoy said about power? Ivan Ilyich had accepted an official position which gave him authority to destroy any person he wanted to. All, without exception, were in his hands, and anyone, even the most important, could be brought before him as an accused. And that is just where our blue boys are. There is nothing to add to the description. The consciousness of this power, and the possibilities of using it mercifully, so Tolstoy qualifies the situation, but this does not in any way apply to our boys, constituted for Ivan Ilyich the chief interest and attraction of the service. But attraction is not the right word. It is intoxication. After all, it is intoxicating. You are still young, still, shall we say, parenthetically, a sniveling youth. 
Only a little while ago, your parents were deeply concerned about you and didn't know where to turn to launch you in life. You were such a fool, you didn't even want to study, but you got through three years of that school and then how you took off and flew. How your situation changed, how your gestures changed, your glance, the turn of your head, the learned council of the scientific institute is in session, you enter and everyone notices you and trembles. You don't take the chairman's chair. Those headaches are for the rector to take on. You sit off to one side, but everyone understands that you are head man there. You are the special department, and you can sit there for just five minutes and then leave. You have that advantage over the professors. You can be called away by more important business. But later on, when you're considering their decision, you will raise your eyebrows, or better still, purse your lips, and say to the rector, You can't do that. There are special considerations involved. That's all, and it won't be done. Or else you are an osobist a state security representative in the army, a smirsh man, and a mere lieutenant. But the portly old colonel, the commander of the unit, stands up when you enter the room and tries to flatter you, to play up to you. He doesn't even have a drink with his chief of staff without inviting you to join them. The fact that you have only two tiny stars on your shoulder boards doesn't mean a thing. It is even amusing. After all, your stars have a very different weight and are measured on a totally different scale from those of ordinary officers. On special assignments, you are sometimes even authorized to wear major's insignia, for example, which is a sort of incognito, a convention. You have a power over all the people in that military unit or factory or district incomparably greater than that of the military commander or factory director or secretary of the district communist party. These men control people's military or official duties, wages, reputations, but you control people's freedom. And no one dares speak about you at meetings, and no one will ever dare write about you in the newspaper. Not only something bad, but anything good. They don't dare. Your name, like that of a jealously guarded deity, cannot even be mentioned. You are there, everyone feels your presence, but it's as though you didn't exist. From the moment you don that heavenly blue service cap, you stand higher than the publicly acknowledged power. No one dares check up on what you do, but no one is exempt from your checking up on him. And therefore, in dealing with ordinary so-called citizens, who for you are mere blocks of wood, it is altogether appropriate for you to wear an ambiguous and deeply thoughtful expression. For of course you are the one, and no one else, who knows about the special considerations. And therefore, you are always right. There is just one thing you must never forget. You, too, would have been just such a poor block of wood if you had not had the luck to become one of the little links in the organs, that flexible, unitary organism inhabiting a nation as a tapeworm inhabits a human body. Everything is yours now. Everything is for you. Just be true to the organs. They will always stand up for you. They will help you swallow up anyone who bothers you. They will help move every obstacle from your path. But be true to the organs. Do everything they order you to. They will do the thinking for you in respect to your functions, too. Today you serve in a special unit. Tomorrow you will sit in an interrogator's armchair. And then perhaps you will travel to Lake Seligar as a folklorist. Partly it may be to get your nerves straightened out. And next you may be sent from a city where you are too well known to the opposite end of the country as a plenipotentiary in charge of church affairs. The violent Yaroslavl interrogator Volkopialov appointed plenipotentiary in charge of church affairs in Moldavia. Or perhaps you will become executive secretary of the Union of Soviet Writers. Another Ilin, this one Viktor Nikolaevich, a former lieutenant general of state security. Be surprised at nothing. People's true appointments and true ranks are known only to the organs. The rest is merely play-acting. Some honored artist or other, or hero of socialist agriculture, is here today, and tomorrow, poof, he's gone. Who are you? asked General Serov in Berlin of the world-renowned biologist Timofey Frasovsky, offensively using the familiar form of address. And the scientist, who was undismayed and who possessed a Cossack's hereditary daring, 
replied, using the same familiar form, And who are you? Serov corrected himself, and this time, using the formal and correct form, asked, Are you a scientist? The duties of an interrogator require work, of course. You have to come in during the day, at night, sit for hours and hours, but not split your skull over proof. Let the prisoner's head ache over that. And you don't have to worry whether the prisoner is guilty or not, but simply do what the organs require, and everything will be all right. It will be up to you to make the interrogation periods pass as pleasurably as possible, and not to get overly fatigued. And it would be nice to get some good out of it, at least to amuse yourself. You have been sitting a long time, and all of a sudden a new method of persuasion occurs to you. Eureka! So you call up your friends on the phone, and you go around to other offices and tell them about it. What a laugh! Who shall we try it on, boys? It's really pretty monotonous to keep doing the same thing all the time. Those trembling hands, those imploring eyes, that cowardly submissiveness, they are really a bore. If you could just get one of them to resist. I love strong opponents. It's such fun to break their backs, said the Leningrad interrogator Shitov to G. G. Blank V. And if your opponent is so strong that he refuses to give in, all your methods have failed and you are in a rage, then don't control your fury. It's tremendously satisfying, that outburst. Let your anger have its way. Don't set any bounds to it. Don't hold yourself back. That's when interrogators spit in the open mouth of the accused and shove his face into a full cuspidor, as happened with Vasiliev, according to Ivanov Razumnik. That's the state of mind in which they drag priests around by their long hair, or urinate in a kneeling prisoner's face. After such a storm of fury, you feel yourself a real honest-to-God man, or else you are interrogating a foreigner's girlfriend. So you curse her out, and then you say, Come on now, does an American have a special kind of... Is that it? Weren't there enough Russian ones for you? and all of a sudden you get an idea. Maybe she learns something from those foreigners. Here's a chance not to be missed, like an assignment abroad. And so you begin to interrogate at her energetically. How? What positions? More? In detail? Every scrap of information? You can use the information yourself, and you can tell the other boys, too. The girl is blushing all over and in tears. It doesn't have anything to do with the case, she protests. Yes, it does. Speak up. That's power for you. She gives you the full details. If you want, she'll draw a picture for you. If you want, she'll demonstrate with her body. She has no way out. In your hands, you hold the punishment cell and her prison term. And if you have asked for a stenographer to take down the questions and answers, and they send in a pretty one, you can shove your paw down into her bosom right in front of the boy being interrogated. The schoolboy, Misha B., He is not a human being, after all, and there is no reason to feel shy in his presence. In fact, there's no reason for you to feel shy with anyone. And if you like the broads, and who doesn't, you'd be a fool not to make use of your position. Some will be drawn to you because of your power, and others will give in out of fear. So you've met a girl somewhere and she's caught your eye. She'll belong to you, never fear, she can't get away. Someone else's wife has caught your eye. She'll be yours, too. Because, after all, there's no problem about removing the husband. For a long time I've been hanging on to a theme for a story to be called The Spoiled Wife, but it looks as though I will never get the chance to write it, so here it is. In a certain Far Eastern aviation unit before the Korean War, a certain lieutenant colonel returned from an assignment to find his wife in a hospital. The doctors did not hide the truth from him. Her sexual organs had been injured by perverted sexual practices. The lieutenant colonel got in to see his wife and wrung from her the admission that the man responsible was the Ostrobist in their unit, a senior lieutenant. It would seem, by the way, that this incident had not occurred without some cooperation on her part. In a rage, the lieutenant colonel ran to the Ostrobist's office, took out his pistol, and threatened to kill him. But the senior lieutenant very quickly forced him to back down and leave the office defeated and pitiful. He threatened to send the lieutenant colonel to rot in the most horrible of camps, where he'd pray to be released from life without further torment, 
and he ordered him to take his wife back just as he found her, with an injury that was to some extent incurable, and to live with her, not to dare get a divorce, and not to dare complain. And all this was the price for not being arrested. The lieutenant colonel did just as he was ordered. I was told the story by the Ossobist's chauffeur. There must have been many such cases because the abuse of power was particularly attractive in this area. In 1944, another Gaibist, state security officer, forced the daughter of an army general to marry him by threatening to arrest her father. The girl had a fiancé, but to save her father she married the Gaibist. She kept a diary during her brief marriage, gave it to her true love, and then committed suicide. No, indeed. To know what it meant to be a blue cap, one had to experience it. Anything you saw was yours. Any apartment you looked at was yours. Any woman was yours. Any enemy was struck from your path. The earth beneath your feet was yours. The heaven above you was yours. It was, after all, like your cap, sky blue. The passion for gain was their universal passion. After all, in the absence of any checking up, such power was inevitably used for personal enrichment. One would have had to be holy to refrain. If we were able to discover the hidden motivation behind individual arrests, we would be astounded to find that, granted the rules governing arrests in general, 75% of the time, the particular choice of whom to arrest, the personal cast of the die, was determined by human greed and vengefulness. And of that 75%, half were the result of material self-interest on the part of the local NKVD, and, of course, the prosecutor, too, for on this point I do not distinguish between them. How, for example, did V.G. Vlasov's 19-year-long journey through the archipelago begin? As head of the district consumer cooperatives, he arranged a sale of textiles for the activists of the local party organization. These materials were of a sort and quality which no one nowadays would even touch. No one was bothered, of course, by the fact that this sale was not open to the general public. But the prosecutor's wife was unable to buy any. She wasn't there at the time. Prosecutor Russoff himself had been shy about approaching the counter, and Vlasov hadn't thought to say, I'll set some aside for you. In fact, given his character, he would never have said this anyway. Furthermore, Prosecutor Rusov had invited a friend to dine in the restricted party dining room. Such restricted dining rooms used to exist in the thirties. This friend of his was not high enough in rank to be admitted there, and the dining room manager refused to serve him. The prosecutor demanded that Vlasov punish the manager, and Vlasov refused. Vlasov also managed to insult the district NKVD, and just as painfully. And he was therefore added to the rightist opposition. The motivations and actions of the blue caps are sometimes so petty that one can only be astounded. Security officer Senchenko took a map case and dispatch case from an officer he'd arrested and started to use them right in his presence. And by manipulating the documentation, he took a pair of foreign gloves from another prisoner. When the armies were advancing, the blue caps were especially irritated because they got only second pick of the booty. The counterintelligence officer of the 49th Army who arrested me had a yen for my cigarette case. And it wasn't even a cigarette case, but a small German army box of a tempting scarlet, however. And because of that piece of shit, he carried out a whole maneuver. As his first step, he omitted it from the list of belongings that were confiscated from me. You can keep it. He thereupon ordered me to be searched again, knowing all the time that it was all I had in my pockets. Aha! What's that? Take it away. And to prevent my protests, put him in the punishment cell. What czarist gendarme would have dared behave that way toward a defender of the fatherland? Every interrogator was given an allowance of a certain number of cigarettes to encourage those willing to confess and to reward stool pigeons. Some of them kept all the cigarettes for themselves. Even in accounting for hours spent in interrogating, they used to cheat. They got higher pay for night work, and we used to note the way they wrote down more hours on the night interrogations than they really spent. Interrogator Fyodorov, Rashetti Station, Post Office Box Number 235, 
stole a wristwatch while searching the apartment of the free person Kozukin. During the Leningrad blockade, interrogator Nikolai Fyodorovich Khrushchev told Yelizaveta Viktorovna Strakovich, wife of the prisoner he was interrogating, K.I. Strakovich, I want a quilt. Bring it to me. When she replied, All our warm things are in the room they've sealed, he went to her apartment and, without breaking the state security seal on the lock, unscrewed the entire doorknob. That's how the MGB works, he explained gaily. And he went in and began to collect the warm things, shoving some crystal in his pocket at the same time. She herself tried to get whatever she could out of the room, but he stopped her. In 1954, although her husband, who had forgiven them everything, including a death sentence that had been commuted, kept trying to persuade her not to pursue the matter, this energetic and implacable woman testified against Khrushchev at a trial. Because this was not Khrushchev's first offence, and because the interests of the organs had been violated, he was given a twenty-five-year sentence. Has he really been in the jug that long? That's enough for you, and he kept on raking in the booty. There's no end to such cases. One could issue a thousand white papers, and beginning in 1918 too, one would need only to question systematically former prisoners and their wives. Maybe there are and were blue caps who never stole anything or appropriated anything for themselves, but I find it impossible to imagine one. I simply do not understand, given the blue caps' philosophy of life, what was there to restrain them if they liked some particular thing. Way back at the beginning of the thirties, when all of us were marching around in the German uniforms of the Red Youth Front and were building the first five-year plan, they were spending their evenings in salons like the one in the apartment of Concordia Iosse, behaving like members of the nobility or Westerners, and their lady friends were showing off their foreign clothes. Where were they getting those clothes? Here are their family names, and one might almost think they were hired because of those names. For example... In the Kemerovo Provincial State Security Administration, there were a prosecutor named Trutnev, Drone, a chief of the interrogation section, Major Shkurkin, self-server, his deputy, Lieutenant Colonel Balandin, Supi, and an interrogator, Skorokhvatov, quick grabber. When all is said and done, one could not invent names more appropriate, and they were all right there together. I need hardly bother to mention again Volko Payalov, wolfskin stretcher, or Grabyshenko, plunderer. Are we to assume that nothing at all is expressed in people's family names and such a concentration of them? Again, the prisoner's faulty memory. I, Korneyev, has forgotten the name of the Colonel of State Security, who was also Concordia Yossa's friend. They both knew her, it turned out who was in the Vladimir detention prison at the same time as Korneyev. This colonel was a living embodiment of the instincts for power and personal gain. At the beginning of 1945, during the height of the war booty period, he got himself assigned to that section of the organs, headed by Abakumov himself, which was supposed to keep watch over the plundering. In other words, they tried to grab off as much as possible for themselves, not for the state, and succeeded brilliantly. Our hero pulled in whole freight car loads and built several dashas, one of them in Klin. After the war, he operated on such a scale that when he arrived at the Novosibirsk station, he ordered all the customers chased out of the station restaurant and had girls and women rounded up and forced to dance naked on the tables to entertain him and his drinking companions. He would have gotten away with this too, but he violated another important rule. Like Kruzhkov, he went against his own kind. Khrushchev deceived the organs. And this colonel did perhaps even worse. He laid bets on which wives he could seduce, and not just ordinary wives, but the wives of his colleagues in the security police. And he was not forgiven. He was sentenced to a political prison under Article 58, and was serving out his time, fuming at their having dared to arrest him. He had no doubt they would change their minds. And perhaps they did. That dread fate, to be thrown into prison themselves, was not such a rarity for the blue caps. There was no genuine insurance against it, but somehow these men were slow to sense the lessons of the past. 
Once again, this is probably due to their having no higher powers of reason. Their low-grade intellect would tell them, It happens only rarely. Very few get caught. It may pass me by. My friends won't let me down. Friends, as a matter of fact, did try not to leave their friends in a bad spot. They had their own unspoken understanding, at least to arrange favorable conditions for friends. This was the case, for example, with Colonel I. Y. Vorobyev in the Marfino special prison, and with the same V. N. Ilin, who was in the Lubyanka for more than eight years. Thanks to this caste spirit, those arrested singly as a result of only personal shortcomings usually did not do too badly, and that was how they were able to justify their sense of immunity from punishment in their day-to-day -day work in the service. But there were several known cases when camp security officers were tossed into ordinary camps to serve out their sentences. There were even instances when, as prisoners, they ran into Zeks who had once been under their thumb and came off badly in the encounter. For example, Security officer Munchin, who cherished a particularly violent hatred toward the 58s in camp, and had relied heavily on the support of the Blatnier, the habitual thieves, was driven right under the board bunks by those very same thieves. However, we have no way to learn more details about these cases in order to be able to explain them. But those Gaibisti, the state security officers, who got caught in a wave were in very serious danger. They had their own waves. A wave is a natural catastrophe and is even more powerful than the organs themselves. In this situation, no one was going to help anyone else lest he be drawn into the same abyss himself. The possibility did exist, however, if you were well informed and had a sharp checkist sensitivity, of getting yourself out from under the avalanche, even at the last minute, by proving that you had no connection with it. Thus it was that Captain Sayenko not the Kharkov Czechist carpenter of 1918-19, to 19, who was famous for executing prisoners with his pistol, punching holes in bodies with his saber, breaking shin bones in two, flattening heads with weights, and branding people with hot irons, but perhaps a relative, was weak enough to marry for love an ex-employee of the Chinese Eastern Railroad named Kokanskaya. And suddenly he found out, right at the beginning of the wave, that all the Chinese Eastern Railroad people were going to be arrested. At this time, he was head of the Security Operations Department of the Archangel GPU. He acted without losing a moment. How? He arrested his own beloved wife, and not on the basis of her being one of the Chinese Eastern Railroad people, but on the basis of a case he himself cooked up. Not only did he save himself, but he moved up and became the chief of the Tomsk province NKVD. This, too, is a theme for a story, and how many more there are in this field. Maybe someone will make use of them some day. The waves were generated by the organ's hidden law of self-renewal, a small periodic ritual sacrifice, so that the rest could take on the appearance of being purified. The organs had to change personnel faster than the normal rate of human growth and aging would ensure, driven by that same implacable urgency that forces the sturgeon to swim up river and perish in the shallows, to be replaced by schools of small fry, a certain number of schools of gaibisti had to sacrifice themselves. This law was easily apparent to a higher intelligence, but the blue caps themselves did not want to accept the fact of its existence and make provision for it. Yet, at the hour appointed in their stars, the kings of the organs, the aces of the organs, and even the ministers themselves, laid their heads down beneath their own guillotine. Yagoda took one such school of fish along with him. No doubt many of those whose glorious names we shall come to admire when we come to the White Sea Canal were taken in this school, and their names thenceforward expunged from the poetic eulogies. Very shortly, a second school accompanied the short-lived Yezhov. Some of the finest cavaliers of 1937 vanished in this one. Yet, one ought not to exaggerate their number. It did not, by any means, include all the best. Yezhov himself was beaten during his interrogation. He was pitiful. And Gulag was orphaned during this wave of arrests. For example, arrested with Yezhov were the chief of the financial administration of Gulag, the chief of the medical administration of Gulag, the chief of the guard service of Gulag, B-O-K-H-R, 
and even the chief of the security operations department of Gulag, who oversaw the work of the camp godfathers. VOKHR, Militarized Guard Service, formerly the Internal Guard Service of the Republic. And later, there was the school of Beria. The corpulent, conceited Abakumov had fallen earlier, separately. Some day, if the archives are not destroyed, the historians of the organs will recount all this step by step, with all the figures and all the glittering names. Therefore, I am going to write only briefly about Ryumin and Abakumov, a story I learned only by chance. I will not repeat what I have already written about them in the first circle. Ryumin had been raised to the heights by Abakumov and was very close to him. At the end of 1952, he came to Abakumov with the sensational report that Professor Ettinger, a physician, had confessed to intentional malpractice when treating Zhdanov and Sherbakov with the purpose of killing them. Abakumov refused to believe him. He knew the whole cookery and decided Ryumin was getting too big for his britches. But Ryumin had a better idea of what Stalin wanted. To verify the story, they arranged to cross-question Ettinger that very evening. But each of them drew different conclusions from his testimony. Abakumov concluded that there was no such thing as a doctor's case. And Ryumin concluded that there was. A second attempt at verification was to take place the following morning. But thanks to the miraculous attributes of the nighttime institution... Ettinger died that very night. In the morning, Ryumin, by passing Abakumov and without his knowledge, telephoned the Central Committee and asked for an appointment with Stalin. My own opinion, however, is that this was not his most decisive step. Ryumin's decisive action, following which his life hung in the balance, was in not going along with Abakumov earlier, and perhaps in having Ettinger killed that same night. Who knows the secrets of those courtyards? Had Ryumin's contact with Stalin begun earlier, perhaps? Stalin received Ryumin, set in motion the doctor's case, and arrested Abakumov. From that point on, it would seem that Ryumin conducted the doctor's case independently of, and even despite, Beria. There were signs before Stalin's death that Beria was in danger, and perhaps it was he who arranged to have Stalin done away with. One of the first acts of the new government was to dismiss the doctor's case. At that time, Ryumin was arrested, while Beria was still in power, but Abakumov was not released. At the Lubyanka, a new order of things was introduced, and for the first time in its entire existence, a prosecutor crossed its threshold, D. Terakov. Imprisoned, Ryumin was fidgety and subservient. I am not guilty, I am here for no reason, he asked to be interrogated. As was his custom, he was sucking a hard candy at the time, and when Terekhoff rebuked him for it, he spat it out on the palm of his hand. Pardon me! As we have already reported, Abakumov roared with laughter, Hocus Pocus! Terekhoff showed him the document authorizing him to inspect the internal prison of the Ministry of State Security. Abakumov brushed it away. You can forge five hundred of those! As an organizational patriot, he was principally offended not by being in prison but by this encroachment on the power of the organs, which could not be subordinate to anything in the world. In July 1953, Ryumin was tried in Moscow and shot, and Abakumov remained in prison. During one interrogation, he said to Terekhov, Your eyes are too beautiful. I am going to be sorry to have to shoot you. This is true. On the whole, D. Terekhov is a man of uncommon strength, of will and courage, which were what was required in bringing the big Stalinists to justice in an uneasy situation. And he evidently has a lively mind as well. If Khrushchev's reforms had been more thoroughgoing and consistent, Terekhov might have excelled in carrying them out. That is how historic leaders fail to materialize in our country. Leave my case alone. Leave it while you still have time. On another occasion, Terekhov called him in and handed him the newspaper which carried the announcement of Beria's exposure. At the time, this was virtually a cosmic upheaval. Abakumov read it, and, with not so much as the twitch of an eyebrow, he turned the page and started to read the sports news. 
On another occasion, during an interrogation in the presence of a high-ranking gay beast who had in the recent past been his subordinate, Abakumov asked him, How could you have permitted the investigation of the barrier case to be conducted by the prosecutor's office instead of by the MGB? Everything in his own domain kept nagging him. He went on, Do you really believe they are going to put me, the Minister of State Security, on trial? The answer was, Yes. And he replied, Then put on your top hat. The organs are finished. He was, of course, too pessimistic, uneducated courier that he was. But when he was in the Lubyanka, Abakumov was not afraid of being tried. He was afraid of being poisoned. This, too, showed what a worthy son of the organs he was. He started to reject the prison food altogether and would eat only eggs that he bought from the prison store. In this case, he simply lacked technical imagination. He thought one couldn't poison eggs. The only books he borrowed from the well-stocked Lubyanka library were the works of, believe it or not, Stalin, who had imprisoned him. But, in all likelihood, this was for show, rather than the result of any calculation that Stalin's adherents would gain power. He spent two years in prison. Why didn't they release him? The question is not a naive one. In terms of his crimes against humanity, he was over his head in blood. But he was not the only one, and all the others came out of it safe and sound. There is some hidden secret here, too. There is a vague rumour that in his time he had personally beaten Khrushchev's daughter-in-law, Lyuba Sedich, the wife of Khrushchev's older son, who had been condemned to a punishment battalion in Stalin's time and who died as a result. And, so goes the rumour, this was why, having been imprisoned by Stalin, he was tried in Leningrad under Khrushchev and shot on December the 18th, 1954. Here is one more of his eccentricities as a VIP. He used to change into civilian clothes and walk around Moscow with Kuznetsov, the head of his bodyguard, and whenever he felt like it, he would hand out money from the Cheka operations funds. Does not this smell of old Russia, charity for the sake of one's soul? But Abakumov had no real reason to be depressed. The organs still didn't perish because of that. As the folk saying goes... If you speak for the wolf, speak against him as well. Where did this wolf tribe appear from among our people? Does it really stem from our own roots, our own blood? It is our own. And just so we don't go around flaunting too proudly the white mantle of the just, let everyone ask himself, if my life had turned out differently, might I myself not have become just such an executioner? It is a dreadful question if one really answers it honestly. I remember my third year at the university in the fall of 1938. We young men of the Komsomol were summoned before the district Komsomol committee, not once but twice. Scarcely bothering to ask our consent, they shoved an application form at us. You've had enough physics, mathematics and chemistry. It's more important to your country for you to enter the NKVD school. That's the way it always is. It isn't just some person who needs you. It is always your motherland and it is always some official or other who speaks on behalf of your motherland and who knows what she needs. One year before, the district committee had conducted a drive among us to recruit candidates for the Air Force schools. We avoided getting involved that time, too, because we didn't want to leave the university. But we didn't sidestep recruitment then as stubbornly as we did this time. Twenty-five years later, we could think, well, yes, we understood the sort of arrests that were being made at the time, and the fact that they were torturing people in prisons, and the slime they were trying to drag us into. But it isn't true. After all, the black mariahs were going through the streets at night, and we were the same young people who were parading with banners during the day. How could we know anything about those arrests, and why should we think about them? All the provincial leaders had been removed, but as far as we were concerned, it didn't matter. Two or three professors had been arrested, but after all, they hadn't been our dancing partners and it might even be easier to pass our exams as a result. Twenty-year-olds, we marched in the ranks of those born the year the revolution took place, and because we were the same age as the revolution, the brightest of futures lay ahead. It would be hard to identify the exact source of that inner intuition, not founded on rational argument, which prompted our refusal to enter the NKVD schools. It certainly didn't derive from the lectures on historical materialism we listened to. 
It was clear from them that the struggle against the internal enemy was a crucial battlefront, and to share in it was an honourable task. Our decision even ran counter to our material interests. At that time, the provincial university we attended could not promise us anything more than the chance to teach in a rural school in a remote area for miserly wages. The NKVD school dangled before us special rations and double or triple pay. Our feelings could not be put into words, and even if we had found the words, fear would have prevented our speaking them aloud to one another. It was not our minds that resisted, but something inside our breasts. People can shout at you from all sides, you must, and your own head can be saying also, you must. But inside your breast there is a sense of revulsion, repudiation. I don't want to. It makes me feel sick. Do what you want without me. I want no part of it. This came from very far back, quite likely as far back as Lermontov, from those decades of Russian life when, frankly and openly, there was no worse and no more vile branch of the service for a decent person than that of the gendarmerie. No, it went back even further. Without even knowing it ourselves, we were ransomed by the small change in copper that was left from the golden coins our great-grandfathers had expended at a time when morality was not considered relative, and when the distinction between good and evil was very simply perceived by the heart. Still, some of us were recruited at that time, and I think if they had really put the pressure on, they could have broken everybody's resistance. So I would like to imagine, if by the time war broke out I had already been wearing an NKVD officer's insignia on my blue tabs, what would I have become? Nowadays, of course, I can console myself by saying that my heart wouldn't have stood it, that I would have objected and at some point slammed the door. But later, lying on a prison bunk, I began to look back over my actual career as an officer, and I was horrified. I did not move in one stride from being a student worn out by mathematics to officer's rank. Before becoming an officer, I spent a half year as a downtrodden soldier. And one might think I would have gotten through my thick skull what it was like always to obey people who were perhaps not worthy of your obedience, and to do it on a hungry stomach to boot. Then, for another half year, they tore me to pieces in officer candidate school. So I ought to have grasped, once and for all, the bitterness of service as a rank-and-file soldier, and remembered how my hide froze and how it was flayed from my body. But did I? Not at all. For consolation, they pinned two little stars on my shoulder boards, and then a third, and then a fourth. And I forgot every bit of what it had been like. Had I at least kept my students' love of freedom? But, you see, we had never had any such thing. Instead, we loved forming up. We loved marches. I remember very well that right after officer candidate school, I experienced the happiness of simplification, of being a military man and not having to think things through, the happiness of being immersed in the life everyone else lived that was accepted in our military milieu the happiness of forgetting some of the spiritual subtleties inculcated since childhood. We were constantly hungry in that school and kept looking around to see where we could grab an extra bite, and we watched one another enviously to see who was the cleverest. But most of all, we were afraid we wouldn't manage to stay in until the time came to graduate and receive our officer's insignia. They sent those who failed to the battle for Stalingrad. And they trained us like young beasts, so as to infuriate us to the point where we would later want to take it out on someone else. We never got enough sleep, because after taps, as punishment, we might be forced to go through the drill alone under the eyes of a sergeant. This book is continued on cassette 6, side 1.